I hope you all are having a wonderful day. My name is Yupari, and I'd like to invite you into this oil painting demonstration. And in this week's portrait painting demonstration, we're going to be working on a 12 by 12 inch MDF board. So that's just a regular um, particle board that I just gessoed twice over with Liquitex uh, professional acrylic gesso. And I'm going to be starting off with a simple underpainting using burnt umber and titanium white and the reason i'm using burnt umber and titanium white is just that burnt umber on its own is a very fast dryer um, titanium white doesn't dry as fast um, but for this instance i think it'll be okay to use titanium white so i'm using a drawing brush this is approximately a size two filbert uh, synthetic bristle mix. So what I'm doing is um, adding a tiny bit of odorless mineral spirits just to get the paint to flow. And so we're going to think about this painting as a type of building process. Notice how I'm going to hold the paintbrush all the way from the furthest corner back. Starting off with just a few simple lines. That's how we're going to start it. Very simple. Very simple. Think about this as a constructive process. Each layer will build on top of the next. So let's see, maybe this is going to be the corner of the side of the head. Not sure of anything at this point. Just trying to kind of get the simple shape of the head placed. So maybe I want to raise this shape up a little bit. So let's move that all the way up here now. So let's say the top of the head will be about there. And the reason I'm working on white uh, is just to try something different. I worked on white last time on last week's painting, uh, but that was just because uh, I was using an oil primed linen canvas and I didn't really want to tone anything over it. This case, in this case, I'm just kind of working on uh, the white acrylic gesso just to change things up. So let's suppose that that's going to be the size of the head approximately that I'm going to want. So let's put the back of the ear over there, a little bit for the collar. Shoulders are going to fall right about here. There's an angle to the shoulders. Somewhat like that. And just using simple straight lines and angles is enough for me to establish uh, kind of my working space for this portrait. We're going to try to push this painting as realistic as we possibly can. Um, that's just, I don't know. I feel like making paintings that are a little bit more realistic these days. Other days I want to be more expressive. Um, but for this demonstration, hopefully, if it turns out well, you'll see how you can start with something like this. Um, super simple, super easy to work with and then build on top of it and create um, some very nice effects. So this right here is the center line. And this is telling me what the head is doing. The head is turned three quarter relative to me. So that means, of course, I'm seeing a little more of this side than this side. And here we're going to just put in a little, little shape for the nose. So now there's a relationship, a horizontal relationship between the ear and the nose. So if I extend this mark just by eye, I'm seeing that the nose fits a little higher up. Now, another thing we won't really want to do is build on our observation skills. Basically, kind of trying to learn how to see in such a way that we take in only the information that we're looking for. And so right now, we're basically um, trying to establish the gesture. So the gesture just means the overall dynamic movement of the pose. So in terms of the movement of the pose, again, we know that the 
head is turned three quarter relative to us. And there isn't really much of a tilt. It's a very standard pose. So let's take a look at the corner of the eye socket. Just a little shape here for where the eye socket might fit. Let's look at the eye socket on the other side. Somewhere about here. Now we're going to be working from general to specific. So we're very loosely just sketching in right now, working very optically, just taking in information that hits our eyes kind of in the periphery, the peripheral uh, vision. So there's the corner of the side of the nose. Look how simple and abstract this is at this stage. So let's just think about this in the abstract, just abstract shapes of light and dark. So now we're moving into the block in phase. And for the rest of the underpainting, uh, that is this layer, we're probably going to be primarily focused on just light and dark. So uh, without putting in the glasses yet, uh, we're just going to take a look at this shape for the eye socket and the structure here for the zygomatic bone, that is the cheekbone. Now, here's the funny thing. You can spend a long time rendering one specific area in the beginning if you want to and build from there. Or you can look at the entire picture just like we're doing now, holistically observing it. And neither way is the only way. There are so many ways to approach portrait painting. You can start off with one little shape here and then build your way out, but we're looking at it holistically. We're looking at the big dynamic picture. Now I'm going to go ahead and take a stab at where the eye might fit. And here's the concavity of the eye socket. Imagine we're imagining the nasal bone is about there. Let's just throw in a single little brush stroke for where the eye might fit there. And let's relate it to the other side, somewhere about there. Now, um, the Liquitex acrylic gesso is actually very absorbent as long as I don't tone it with acrylic paint. Um, I, I worked on the similar surface several times in the past and I had a lot of trouble with the paint slipping around. But uh, I think it actually works a little better if you just leave the acrylic gesso alone, like we're doing here, and then just build the layers of oil paint on top. So now what we're doing is we're going in with a piece of paper towel that has a little bit of odorless mineral spirits on it. And this is going to be kind of our eraser. If you've seen any of my drawing videos, you know that I like to use uh, charcoal and a chamois as an eraser. So this paper towel is pretty much like a chamois cloth would be uh, to me if I were just working on a charcoal drawing. And I'm trying to think of this as a drawing, not really too focused on the aspect of making a painting or anything like that. I'm just focused on the same thing that I would be focused on if I were using charcoal, which is just simple shape. So let's subtract a little bit over here. This shape comes up a little more. So I'm just going to be working on these simple patterns of light and dark for quite a while. And then I'm going to go ahead and add a layer of value using a combination of the titanium white and burnt umber. But for now, it's just burnt umber, paper towel, and odorless mineral spirits. Go ahead and subtract a little bit here. And try not to be so literal, especially in the start. 
and try not to lock yourself into something so early either. You can have quite a bit of freedom in working in this way holistically that you probably wouldn't have if you were working, uh, say, one piece at a time. Not to say that any one particular method is better. I'm just showing you kind of what's going on in my mind. So I'm telling you what's going on in my mind as I'm creating these shapes. Now, it's important to keep your shapes simple and easy to work with. And most of you know why I'm gonna say that. It's important to keep your shapes simple and easy to work with. And some of you may be able to complete my sentence, but for those of you that can't complete my sentence, keep your shapes simple and easy to work with so that when the time comes to make any adjustments, those adjustments will be simple and easy to work with. So now we kind of have a simple shape for the head. I'm just gonna go ahead and cover the rest of the white up here. Now, it's not so difficult to move a nose or to move a mouth or anything like that. Um, but the challenge really is to get the entire is to get all the elements to work with one another. So that's why uh, recently I've been kind of working in this way. You may have seen in some of my other videos that I would work one part at a time and then build from there. Now let's think about the entire shape of the head as one unit, just one overall simplified unit and we're going to build all of the tiny shapes on top of that unit. And try to train your observation skills. So put one thing in, step back, ask yourself, does it work, does it not work? And then move forward from there. Now I'm going to go ahead and subtract a little bit down here. Don't want to put too much information there for the eyes yet. This shape might actually have to cut back a little bit. Now in the beginning, it's okay if your start, suppose you're now 20 minutes into your painting, and, you're, and, it, and it looks nothing like the model which is where I'm at right now. That's perfectly fine. At this stage, we're looking for information. So we're gathering information. That's what we're doing. Trying to find just simple shapes. Now let's go ahead and look at this outside shape. This might actually have to cut in a little bit more. And this is kind of an unexpected result. Um, these little tones coming out from the paper or towel. I didn't mean to do that. It kind of just happened, but I don't know. It looks fine. I mean, obviously I'm not gonna leave it like this. I'm gonna go over it with the titanium white. So I'm kind of going in a circular fashion here to get the bulb of the nose, the shape for the bulb of the nose. This is kind of interesting. I've never worked in this way where I was able to get a tone just using the uh, paper towel. So let's go ahead and exploit that. A little tone over here, and this is almost exactly like charcoal. Interesting. Now for the mouth, I would suggest, especially in the block-in, to just use maybe two or three lines for the mouth. See that? 
two or three lines for the mouth, and then think about the overall structure containing the mouth. That is this little shape out here. And this shape here. Very simple. Now a good a good uh, person to look at is Diego Velasquez. If you look at a lot of his, uh, the features, especially the nose and the mouth, the features look like they were painted very quickly. They're only a couple brush strokes. But what makes it, what makes a Velasquez so strong is the fact that the whole entire unit, everything just fits. Everything just fits with one another. So it's very interesting. I didn't think that I would be getting any kind of value transitions like that with the uh, burnt umber and the paper towel, but it's starting to turn out that way. Very interesting. Now, of course, let's pick up some of the paint from here. <laughs> let's experiment. Let's experiment. Push this back here. Strange place to be in because I've never done this before. Seems to be working out pretty nicely, though. You know what? Let's go ahead and throw in something for the glasses. I'm, f I'm feeling adventurous. Let's do this. Little shape here. Goes all the way down here. I might regret doing this this early, but oh well. This is a building process. Such a simple little shape there for the glasses. Let's see, so that is telling me I have to push that shape back a little bit. Just try to keep the features as just a couple little brush marks. Simple little shape there. Don't need much. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the this little back side of the head. Realism is very deceptive. That is the art of making something appear like something. Because right now, what I'm really focused on is just basically these contours, the outside contours, and how the big shape uh, is going to help the transition from large, overall large picture to small picture. I'm very well aware that I'm gonna wanna come into all of these shapes later and add much more information. So I better make sure that this outside shape, uh, this scaffolding, is the best that I can make it. Shape comes out here. This comes back in like this. Probably push that out too far. That's okay. Can always cut that shape back in. It's important to know what you're looking for. Remember this stage, we're still in the block-in stage and we're gonna be in the block-in stage for most of the underpainting. And it's important to know what you're looking for and why you're looking for it. So what we're looking for is just simple patterns of light and dark. Go ahead and look at a Caravaggio, his use of uh, chiaroscuro. And all that is is just very accurate usage of light and dark. Cutting that shape back in a little bit. I think that there's a little more of an angle here. 
go ahead and make this all dark. Let's go ahead and reassess this shape here. So a very specific angle to this. And remember, the block in is a very back and forth kind of thing. You put something down, you think it's right, you stand back, you see that it could be adjusted a little bit. And it's okay. It's okay to take your time. No one's going to rush you. Now that we have a rough idea of where all these shapes are going to fit, remember we only have just a few brush strokes for each feature. So what I did was I uh, combined the titanium white and the burnt umber into a value scale on my palette so we can push the underpainting a little bit further. And I'm going to be just taking from each individual value uh, in order to create the, uh, the structure of the portrait. So again, these, this is just a value scale containing nine values, just using burnt umber and titanium white. So now we're gonna be looking at individual areas or individual zones in which we want to develop the portrait even further. So let's take a look at this value here. Now the paint, does have a little bit of uh, Neo McGilp. That is my fast drawing medium. Uh, now that does kind of break the rule of fat over lean. In general, you don't really want to start off using too much uh, oil. So if conservation is what you're after, don't start off with uh, oil just yet. But the reason I'm using oil, uh, Neo McGilp, oil is just to let this layer that I'm applying now be dry uh, much faster. So I'm taking a look at each individual plane. So this plane change here is a little bit darker than this plane. So this plane here is darker than this plane. And this plane is much more light facing. So as we move over here, so let's get a little bit lighter. As we move towards this area here, now that's an exaggeration, but that area is going to be much lighter. So with the underpainting, what we want to do is just continue to develop the drawing. And uh, I want to keep my edges rather soft. And having this value scale mixed up, the value scale that you see on my palette, having that pre-mixed for me, uh, it does two things. It helps me keep my organization a little bit more clear in terms of uh, knowing exactly what value I'm using at any given time. But it also just makes the process a lot faster. So I definitely recommend you try this out. Definitely do try this at home. And the way that I'm cleaning off the brush, I'll show you in a second. This is how I clean it off. So I apply the paint, so it's darker here, right? So it's getting a little darker over here. And then I want to get lighter over here near, near the frontal ridge of the forehead. This is all I do. Just rub the paint off with the uh, paper towel. And that's it. And that's how I'm moving forward. Just a little technical tip to get you to move much faster. And I'm looking at each individual zone and analyzing their spatial relations, spatial relationships to one another. Meaning this area here is lighter than this area here because this is the frontal ridge of the skull and it's picking up a lot more light. So 
see how with very few value changes on the side um, here, we're starting to get the curvature of the form. And that's what we're after. We're after the values and how the values describe the form. See how there's going to be a definitive side plane here? <clears throat> Excuse me. So these values are going to be much lighter over here. And then there's going to be an overlap of form right over here. See how this is an overlap of form? So the form is going turning away from the light here towards the light here. And then up here, of course, it's turning more towards the light. And of course, this is going to be a much more subtle gradation of tone. A little darker over here. Very simple. Now, have you noticed I'm kind of patting the brush um, as I apply the paint as opposed to going in broad brush strokes? So going in with large and broad brush strokes is what you'll see me do when I'm working a la prima. Um, but when I'm trying to analyze each individual little region of tone and structure, I'm going to be sticking with a smaller brush and just kind of just like with a graphite pencil. So it's very similar to drawing. Uh, if I have a sharpened piece of charcoal or a sharpened point to a graphite pencil, you'll see me kind of just doing the same kind of movement with the brush as I'm doing with the, uh, as I would do with the pencil. Now we're going to be moving on down. So here's the side, side plane of the forehead. Much darker there. So I'm going to use my fan brush just to help eliminate some of the glare. But it also helps to soften the edges as well. A little transitioning plane over here. Notice how I keep moving up and down the value scale just to get these gradations of value. Now, the light is definitely most apparent over here, but we also have to take into account that the form is turning away from the light the furthest on this side, meaning that there's gonna be definite, definitely a shadow on the side of the forehead over here. I'm kind of pushing this value change a little more than I see it, just because conceptually I know that the form on this side would be getting darker as it turns away from the light, just simply because of the positioning of the highlight being over on this corner and the form turning around here. So let's push that a little bit darker. Trying to keep my edges rather soft. Now let's keep moving on down. So let's switch to these values here. It's going to be a little bit darker here. So now at this point, you're probably wondering, am I working over top of a dry layer? Okay, so funny story. So you know that I mixed up this value scale on the side, so you know I had time to mix up that value scale. So what happened was, in between the last clip and this current clip, I actually had to go away for a couple of hours, and I came back, I came back and this was already dry. Go figure. This dries in a couple of hours, just mineral spirits and burnt umber. This is dry. 
but it kind of dried to my advantage, to be honest, because now I can just go in and just literally build form on top of form. So there's going to be a darker area over here. Here's the side of the eye socket. Notice how even at this stage, I'm not even thinking about eyelashes, eyeball, iris, nothing. I'm not really thinking about any kind of detail. That's the trick. Try to focus on the big picture, large overall structure. And then the detail, the smaller shapes, the parts that everyone seems to always be impressed with in, in uh, classical or realist paintings. You know how everyone's always like, look at all the detail. This painter must be amazing. Um, really, the detail, getting in the small little shapes on the eyes and the nose and the nostril just right, that's not the hard part. And I'm showing you the hard part. The hard part is really trying to understand this structure and understanding the values. Here's the side plane of the nose. The values really describe the form really, really the best and the most simple. And don't worry, we will add color on top of this. This is also a very relaxing way of working. I tend to say that every time I, um, I'm working in a classical fashion, but it really is. I mean, I'm really just taking my time looking at this side plane and then analyzing how that form is turning around. See here, how I'm moving up the value scale, just observing each form at a time. No rush. Take a little more light. Super simple. Even more light over here. Just going to be softening the edges. Now, remember that as I admitted, this layer did dry. So there's actually going to be a little bit of warmth showing through the underpainting, which is different than any underpainting I've ever done. So a lot of a lot of happy little accidents happening with this painting. And that's okay. It's an ex ex exploration. A bit lighter over here. Have to make sure to take my time with these shapes. Definitely don't want to get the nose off its axis. But if it happens, it happens. You can always come back and correct it. There's the side plane of the wing of the nose. Then it's going to get darker here, near the bottom. Then lighter up here near the bulb of the nose. Then really light near the top plane of the bulb of the nose. And then, of course, we're going to have a little highlight. Let's get even lighter. A little highlight for the nose. A little bit of light over here. going to be darker 
right around this area here. Now this plane is overlapping. So this plane is overlapping with this plane. Just soften that edge a little bit. It's gonna be even lighter up here. And there's gonna be a little transitioning plane right here. So the maxilla region of the face being this area here to wrap right over here into the side plane of the nose. Gotta bridge that gap. Making sure that each one of these shapes relates to one another. And we can do this completely with value. A little darker over here. We're going to follow through on the other side. It's going to be even darker over here. Very simple. Then a little lighter as we go across here. Not really thinking about any of the details. Let's just focus on the structure. And now we're angling more towards the light over here. So it's gonna get even lighter. A little darker here. And we're getting darker as we turn around the side plane. It's a zygomatic bone. There's even a darker shape up here that I missed earlier. Very subtle. Now let's keep moving on down. So again, this plane change is gonna be a little bit darker. Now the trick is gonna to be to, even though we're observing that this area appears darker, it's still not gonna be quite as dark as this area because if, as you notice, this area on the corner, even though you can't really see it, is gonna be in shadow. So before we get too carried away with the darks and the light, um, that is, before we get too carried away with putting so many dark values in the light, let's go ahead and put in the dark value here, even if we can barely see it in the shadow, making sure that light and shadow are not lost. And this is one area where photography, depending on how you take the photograph, tends to flatten out the images. On the photo reference, this shape and this shape might actually look almost the same value, right? Uh, but in, in, in life, this area right here is definitely going to be darker uh, because it's turning away from the light. But depending on the camera that you have, uh, cameras tend to uh, flatten out those distinctions. So let's get a little bit lighter now. And here we're gonna have another little overlap of form. This is gonna be the top plane of the zygomatic bone, the cheekbone, and then the side plane, zygomatic bone. Now, there's gonna be another little value change over here. Very subtle, but noticeable. A little value change there. And then let's paint in this plane. So 
see how we start to create the curvature of form. Now, this is probably a little too puffy right now, but again, we're just getting started with these values. A little bit lighter here. I'm trying to keep these edges rather soft. Now it's going to get darker down here. It's going to be a very definitive plane change here. Notice how these forms are overlapping with one another. And that's how you create the structure. And again, it's going to be darker down here. Even darker over here. Because this plane, as you notice, the contour it's telling us, hey, this angle is turning even further away from the light now. So it's going to be getting even darker over here. Just a little, there's a little too much light showing here. So let's make it darker. Not that dark somewhere in between these two values. Now you can definitely see how the form is going to overlap. Light, dark, light, dark. So let's go ahead and put this light back. These are overlaps of form. Form in painting is universal. The form on a change in value with a pomegranate is no different than the uh, form on a Greek sculpture. The form, the way you would handle form on a Greek sculpture would be the same way you would handle it on a pineapple. It'd be the same way you would handle it on an apple or any other kind of still life, figure, portrait, doesn't matter what it is. It's all about understanding how these forms are interacting with the light, meaning the angle of each individual form. That is, again, this angle here still needs to get, this plane still needs to get darker because it's angling away from the light even further. And the same thing over here. Still needs to get a little darker. Remember, the way you would handle form with portrait is the same as the way you would handle form painting a still life. That's why a lot of uh, academic art schools start off their students with cast drawings or cast paintings, spending months and months and months and months. Uh, studying sculptures. Just to train the artist to see how the form interacts with the light. Now let's look at the other side now. This area here is definitely going to be darker. A little bit darker over here. There's going to be another form overlap. Meaning this form here. It's going to get darker. And the form next to it, this form here is going to be lighter much the value it already is. And then down here, it's going to get darker. 
notice here notice here there's kind of a communication between the forms the inner planes here and the straight lines on the corner so usually when you start off with straight lines and angles with your block in it can very easily translate into uh, planar thinking when you're in this stage of the painting. And I still think it's going to get a little bit darker over here. Right down here, this is going to be the bottom of the mouth. And this little shape here is going to get darker and lighter up here. That's how simple you can create form. A little bit darker over here. Now I know you might be thinking, what about the color? Aren't you going to get the color? Well, just like I did in last week's video, I created a monochromatic underpainting and then added the color on top. And that's what we're going to do with this one. sit back and relax. That's what I think about with the classical approach to portrait painting. Just sitting back and relaxing. One step at a time. No one's going to rush you. It's going to be a little darker over here. A little darker here. Definitely darker here. Another form overlap that I didn't notice before. And over here, it's getting darker as it's turning away from the light. And getting lighter over here. Still got to make sure to keep these edges rather soft. Very light touch. And let's just herd the paint over here. A little lighter over here. Get this dark shape. Now we're going to start to add a little bit of information for the for the light of the eye. So again, I'm just taking right off my palette just the colors that I mixed up previously or sorry, the values that I mixed up. So here's the light of the eye of the sclera. A little bit of light over here. Now let's take a look at the other side. Somewhat over here. And remember, the most important thing you can get out of the underpainting is the drawing. 
So we're kind of prioritizing the drawing a little bit. It's going to be a little darker now over here for the upper eyelid. Let's put in a little shape here for the iris. Let's do the same to the other side. I don't need much. And there's going to be a little bit of light on the upper eyelid. A little bit of light. Reaching down here. as well as back here. Of course, it's going to be a little darker than that. Now the trick is going to be how not to put too much information, but just enough in the relatively correct location. Now let's take a look at the uh, form the overlaps of form so right over here it's going to be a little bit darker it's going to be a little bit lighter as we move up here towards the light Then it's going to get darker again, right around here. It's going to be quite darker up here. It's going to be a little shadow from the glasses. And there's going to be even a tiny little glimpse of light. Not sure if I want to put it in just yet, but tiny glimpse of light down there. And over here, very tiny. And of course, the highlight needs to be taken into account. Very simple. Just dropping in some touches of light. Now for the nose, I think I'm going to keep it rather simplified. So let's just go ahead and reestablish this dark here. Let's just make sure that the nose is three quarter, just like the structure of the head. So what I'm doing is I'm just looking, I'm reassessing this center line. So I should be seeing more of this side of the nose than this side of the nose, but still there's a little, little glimpse of the wing of the nose on this side. So let's go ahead and put that in very cautiously. 
trying to make sure not to lose my center line. Or building just a tiny little glimpse of the wing of the nose on the other side. Very subtle. A little darker over here. Let's go ahead and reassess this dark shape. Got to make sure that we're seeing more of this side of the nose. Let's go ahead and just push that shape out. And I think that ought to do it just about for the nose. Now for the mouth, don't really need that much either. Remember with the mouth, it's much easier to, to move it around than say the nose and the nose is much easier to move around than say the eyes but let's be honest we're never really going to get everything correct first try so that's why myself included so that's why i really think it's a good idea to utilize an underpainting such as this one so we have the dark accents for the mouth that we just put in it's going to be kind of a darker plane up here, just to kind of give the characteristic of the mouth. And then there's going to be a little bit of light reaching here. But of course, that value is darker. So just a little bit of a darker value there. Don't need much. That's the secret. Don't put too much in, but put just enough that's as accurate as you can make it. And it'll make all the difference. A little more light over here. Just throwing just a little touch of highlight. A little tiny touch of highlight. Now for the ear, don't want to spend too much time on the ear, but I do need to put something in here for the ear. So it's going to be a little darker over here, lighter over here, not that light, then lighter down here. And this whole area here is going to get a little darker. So let's just put in that tone. And then build onto it. See how we're building that transition right on top of that layer? It's going to be a darker shape right here near the tragus of the ear. Then some light back here. Don't need much. A little more light back here. That just about ought to do it. Mm. 
now that we've covered some of these light areas with a few uh, value changes, now we're going to go in and establish the rest of the masses, and then after that we'll let it dry for the next layer. So I'm going to use a little bit of Neo McGilp. Remember, it's just a gel-like medium. And I'm going to just very uh, apply a very thin layer of dark value for the background. So again, I wouldn't recommend using medium like I am uh, too early on, but I, you know, I think we'll be all right. I just want this layer to dry uh, relatively quickly. So I think this value, this value is about good. So I'm gonna go ahead and cover the rest of the background now. Now that we have the background covered, I think I'm gonna go and put in some information for the hair. So let's start off with, say, this value. So there are some areas that are darker and some areas that are lighter. So I'm gonna start off with the dark. So it's a little darker over here. Now I'm applying the brush marks again. You can even see it in the background. I applied the brush marks in a diagonal. And as you know, that's just to avoid glare. I don't want the painting to glare too much for the camera. Remember glaring just means like reflecting light. So let's just cover all of this now. Now for the hair, I'm thinking of the shape, just the shape of the hair itself. And then the individual little pieces I can always adjust in the next layer, but I just wanna get the shape right. Or as accurate as I can make it. Now, if you've never made an underpainting uh, before, a monochromatic underpainting, I would really suggest it. It's much more relaxing than uh, trying to paint everything all at once. And it also kind of teaches you uh, paint handling, a little bit more about how paint handles when applying successive layers. And it's a little, say, a little darker over here. So um, remember, I'm using Neo McGilp as my painting medium. And remember, Neo McGilp is a, it's a medium made by Gamblin. It's a fast dryer. And Burnt Umber, the dark color that I'm using, is a fast dryer. So at the end, what you have is a very fast drying underpainting, which I think is a pretty ideal. But I'm also noticing uh, it's starting to get tacky. Tacky meaning like uh, when paint starts to dry on you, it starts to feel a little sticky. Around here in my palette, I can feel that it's starting to get sticky. Um, so one thing I do to kind of combat that is to, again, Here's my cup, my Neo McGilp, you can't even see it, it's barely even in there anymore. But I just dip it into the gel, and then it makes the paint a little bit more fluid again. In any case, I'm just trying to get the shapes right. A little bit of a dark shape here. And as I'm doing this, I'm starting to notice that I might need a little bit more for the forehead, I think. A little bit more distance. Not entirely sure. But I'm guessing I need a little more. 
So let's just push that up a tiny bit. And another little tip for painting the hairline, this edge right here that I'm painting is the softest edge usually. So I'm trying to make this very soft. And at the same time, I'm kind of pushing the hairline up. It's kind of a little lost edge there. Let's go back into the dark. Again, I'm going to use a little bit of Neo McGilp because this, these darker shapes that have mostly burnt umber, these darker areas on the palette, are really starting to fight with me right now. meaning that they're starting to get tacky. Moving this over here. So there are some lighter shapes over here that I can't ignore. Might help give us some characteristics of the model. It's a little light patch over here. Just a simple little shape there for that. And again, I'm really just trying to get the shape. In the next layer, I'll be able to add a little more specificity into the hair. Let's go ahead and just put this little shape. Might be getting ahead of ourselves with that, but oh well. Let's have fun with it. Now, with the underpainting, I usually never regret anything that I do in the underpainting. It's always a building process. I'm always very thankful for spending more time than I perhaps uh, originally thought I would on an underpainting. Just really sets you up for uh, more specificity when you start to apply the color. But again, just trying to soften these edges. Just softening them. I'm going to get the fan brush to also add some more softening and also eliminate some of the glare. Now then, I think I'm going to add a little value down here. I just feel like the light is jumping out a bit too much. So we're gonna use a little bit of Neo McGilp on the brush. I don't know, let's say this value here. Now it should be darker. This value should be darker than the flesh tones, I think. That's too light, but it's the same, it's kind of the value I need for this shape here. So let's just put that in there. Now let's go back to the dark. There we go. Now we're getting the shapes that we want. Going to switch brushes really quickly. Want some light over here. So let's see if this value is acceptable. And I'd say that that value is about good. So I'm gonna go ahead and cover the rest of this shape now with this value. And now what I think I'll do is just add a few little shapes in here for the collar. Not really gonna do too much for the collar. Just adding a few shapes here. A little, little bit of a curl there. And let's just suggest this little dark shape here. Simple little suggestion there. 
And while we have this dark value, let's go ahead and just make this shadow a little darker and a little more quiet. Going to soften this edge a little bit. And now over here, a little dark shape for the collar. Now I have to move pretty quickly because this burnt umber is really starting to dry. You'd be amazed at how quickly burnt umber dries under the influence of uh, a fast drying medium such as Neo McGilp. Just a little suggestion there. So tacky. Gotta add more medium. There we go. Now we're making a mark. And I think I'm gonna get the fan brush and just soften this edge around the ear. Yeah, even that's getting really tacky. Hopefully this will be dry soon so I can add the next layer. And uh, I think I'll, I'll leave it like this and uh, hopefully overnight it'll be dry and I'll be able to apply the next layer. All right, so it's the next day and I thought I would show you guys something that I do once in a while before filming, so. Uh, the painting is now dry, but I want my paints to be a little less oily. So one thing I'll do is I'll actually put them on a sheet of paper towel for about, I don't know, 20 to 30 minutes and let the paper towel soak up the excess oil. So if you ever wonder why my paint, sometimes uh, you'll notice it'll start like falling down the palette. Uh, other times it doesn't fall down the palette and that's when I, that's when you know that I've done this process. So the paper towel just sucks up the excess oil and yeah, that really helps out. All right, so luckily for us, this painting has dried overnight. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply a little bit of Neo McGilp medium. So this is just a little bit of Neo McGilp on the cap of the uh, tube itself. So what this is going to do is help to bring back the original values uh, that the painting had when it was wet and it will also help to kind of apply, I don't know, it helps to make the surface feel as though you're painting wet on wet. And another thing it does is, um, now I can't really confirm this, but I know that uh, the general rule when you're layering paintings like this is fat over lean, meaning that you want to add more and more oil as you move up in your number of layers. So what I typically do is I'll add a layer of oil. So this is what I'm doing. This is also called oiling out. So I just add the oil onto the surface and then I usually don't use any more oil throughout the sitting. Now I usually work multiple sittings on my own studio work. So this is kind of the, uh, the way that I build up my studio paintings. So I'm just gonna fill the rest of this now. Doesn't need to be perfect. But the portrait itself does need to be mostly covered. Alright, so the palette that I'll be using today consists of titanium white, flake white, burnt umber, alizarin permanent, cadmium red medium, yellow ochre, ultramarine blue, and ivory black. And if you want to know exactly what materials I'll be using throughout uh, this painting, you can always go ahead and scroll down to the description box below and I'll have all of that information typed up for you. Before we get started, I think it's a good idea to mix up a, a value scale of flesh colors. 
on the palette, especially when you're going to work on an underpainting that already has uh, a few values in it. So for the lightest light, I'm going to throw in just titanium white and yellow ochre. Now, I do this to help me keep track of my value scales and to have an idea of uh, basically my colors in relation to one another on the palette. So now that I'm moving down, I'm going to be combining burnt umber with yellow ochre, but I'm not going to, I'm going to try to avoid using too much burnt umber because as you noticed in the underpainting, burnt umber tends to dry extremely fast, especially with that layer of uh, Neo Miguel medium. So now I'm going to use a tiny bit of ultramarine blue, tiny bit. Now we're back to the cadmium red, yellow ochre. Now we're in the middle region of the palette. I'm going to use a little bit of ivory black, a lizard permanent. So when I'm in the mid range of the palette, uh, I usually think of the cheek. The zygomatic region so the cheek is a little a little warm so we have some warmth in there so a lizard and permanent yellow ochre back to the ultramarine a little more ultramarine blue and i will be um modifying these colors as I mix on the palette. But as you're observing me create these flesh tones, the mixtures that I'll be using on the painting won't be any more complicated than this. So if you're ever curious as to how I mix my flesh tones, I know you don't always see those clips, especially when I'm in close up. This is essentially how I do it. Just sometimes I'll tweak it more red, I'll tweak it more yellow ochre or I'll tweak it cooler with combination of these two. Now the flake white is a pretty heavy body white and it has this property that it allows me to use more of it as you're noticing now without raising the value too much. So that's why I like to have both titanium and flake white. Flake white usually resides somewhere here in the middle and then titanium is up here in the lighter colors. And now let's just get a really nice dark dark. Ivory black and a lizard permanent. All right, so now we're going to put in our first little colors and values for the flesh tones. And so with this painting, I'm definitely going to slow it down and work one piece at a time. So let's go ahead and start. Let's, let's try not to start in the eyes. I really want to start in the eyes. But um, as a general rule, I think that it's safer to start somewhere especially when you're reworking a painting in, a, in another sitting, start somewhere that is a little less demanding, a little less intellectually demanding. So I would say a good area to start off with would be the forehead. So this is just a fan brush I use to eliminate glare. So I'm just going to be analyzing each individual shape of color. So I see this as a little more a lavender, kind of a lavender pink, dark pink and then we're going to get a little bit lighter and warmer see how I'm tinting the color not very difficult so just tinting it a little bit warmer so usually in the drawing I tend to say if you keep things simple and easy to work with then when the time comes as you know because I've probably said this a couple times before already in this video those changes will be simple and easy to manage. Same thing goes with color. Keep your color simple. Doesn't have to be complicated. 
a little bit warmer. So we're throwing in a little bit more cadmium red medium, yellow ochre. Now, as far as color is concerned, um, I usually suggest artist grade colors. Um, and that's just because of the strength of the pigment, especially when you're going to be using something like flake white. You really want the pigment to to show in the painting. And um, student grade is fine, but when you're going to try to get more subtle color such as these, uh, you're really going to want to have the the highest quality you can get, and that is artist grade. Now, I don't have anything too expensive. I mean, this is just a combination of Gamblin and Winsor & Newton. Fairly inexpensive colors, but still artist grade. So I think it's getting darker here, but it's also going to get a little bit more pink. A little more pink. There we go. A little darker over here. Let's add a little bit of alizarin permanent, ivory black. So it does get a little darker here. And the alizarin and the ivory black helps me get kind of like a lavenderish color. Now, alizarin is a very nice tinting color. It's not very opaque. At least I don't think it is. It doesn't feel that opaque. So it allows me to tint colors that I want to be more reddish. And the reason we're going to be spending our time uh, with each section at a time, I know it, it annoys some folks when I'm like this, applying each brush mark at a time. I know most of you would probably want to see like a big brush just whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. but I'm really just not I'm not focused too much on the brush stroke. I'm focused much more on the information that I'm conveying within each shape. And then in the end, if I want it to be more brushy, then I'll go in with a bigger brush and make it more brushy. But I'm just focused on these planes. See how we're moving up lighter? as we start to walk our way towards the light. And then here it's gonna be even lighter, but let's throw in more pink. Even lighter over here. And so we're building onto the underpainting. Building onto it, not painting over it. Don't think about painting over an underpainting. Think about building onto it. Get a little more pink. I believe this area has quite a bit of the flake white. It has a little more uh, body to it. And for these lighter areas, I'm painting a little more transparent. So that's another advantage that you're going to have when you're working in successive layers. Uh, then you have this new strength, this new tool, uh, at your disposable, and that is transparency and opacity in the application of paint. So I have intentionally in the underpainting let some of the areas be lighter, especially in this area here. So I'm trying to use a type of stained glass effect. So I'm painting a little more transparent in the lights, and the, the way that I'm doing that is again through my flake white. Uh, so remember the flake white allows me to use a little more of it and without uh, raising the value too much. And it also feels rather transparent. So you can actually kind of see some of the underpainting showing through. And you can also achieve this effect by just using less paint. So let's see here, there's a predominant value change here. So let's go down on the value scale. It's getting much darker here. 
So it's going to be darker as we approach these form overlaps. So let's get darker. See how it's going to get darker right over here. Now let's remix this little area. So a lizard permanent, ultramarine blue, yellow ochre. So we're basically just kind of recharging this area of the palette. And again, I'm really trying to watch out for burnt number. Not trying to use too much of it. Yellow ochre, cadmium red, back to the yellow ochre, so now let's take some of this darker value. And that's, that's about right. So there's going to be a pretty significant form overlap here. So it's going to get darker as we angle away from the light. Then it'll get lighter as we pull towards the light. So we angle towards the light. Get even lighter. Now we're starting to have that form look like it's starting to overlap. These are form overlaps. So you can picture kind of a topographical map going right there, go down, up again, go down, up again, uh, and so on. So this is the frontal area of the skull here, just above the eye socket. So it's going to be receiving a little more light. So it's going to be a little lighter, which means that I'm not going to paint as thick. So I'm up here in this region. Should be a little darker than that. Let's use a little bit of ultramarine blue to tint this a little bit less orange. That's about right. A little bit lighter. And now we're starting to really feel the volume of the side plane of the forehead. And then, of course, a little bit lighter and pinker up there. I'm going to use the fan brush to eliminate some glare and to soften the edges. So now it's really starting to look like his forehead is kind of emerging out of the light. So let's go ahead and move further down. Let's see. I really, I really want to paint this eye. I've been staring at that eye for a while. So now we're all warmed up. As we painted this little area of the forehead, now we can venture down towards the eye. So I'm in this kind of area of the value scale. It's a little bit pinker. Painting very transparent now. Very transparent. A little bit lighter here. Now these are going to be some very, very tiny value changes. So it's going to be just a little bit darker here. See that? You can barely see the value change. But it's there. Just very, very subtle. Now the next thing I'll do is get a, a different brush, apply a little bit of odorless thinner, 
odorless mineral spirits. So you might know what I'm mixing up now. So just titanium white ivory black. Just titanium white ivory black. A little bit of flesh tone. A little touch of flesh tone. Let's throw in some ultramarine blue. A little bit of ultramarine blue shouldn't hurt. Now at this point you probably know what I'm going to color in. That is the sclera of the eye. Needs to be a little bit darker. So I'm going to add a little bit of, I added a little bit of ivory black. So now we're talking. Now we're definitely going to get some very subtle gradations. Don't worry, we'll get the close up very soon. We definitely want to make this painting as realistic as we can make it. A little bit more ivory black. And, and this uh, wooden dowel is just kind of a support for my hand. So now we're going to be using this little tiny brush. We really want to make this eye look like it's just emerging out of. Uh, we really want the portrait to look like it's very three dimensional. So paying attention to all of these subtle value gradations is going to be our ticket to getting there. So a little more ivory black and ultramarine blue with my little tiny brush. Now it's not very evident on the photograph, but I know it would be here. It's a slight little, slight little cast shadow on the sclera being casted from the upper eyelid. Very tiny stuff. Now back to my larger brush. I'm in the darker mid-tone region of the palette. Now this area here is going to get much darker. Remember, it's really all about the values when it comes to trying to get the illusion of form. But of course, color plays an important role. So this color here is a little darker, but a little warmer. It has a touch of the alizarin permanent that I put in the darker mid-tone region of the palette. And it's going to be a little bit lighter and a little bit pinker to the right of it. So over here, a little bit lighter, a little bit more pink. This is also kind of referred to as um, window shading, where you just pick a little tiny window and try to basically just shade it, render it, bring it to life. So that's what we're trying to do. A little bit darker here. This gets a little bit darker here as it's turning away from the light. And even darker over here. And now there's going to be a pretty dark area. So there's a cast shadow being projected from the glasses. So it's a little bit of burnt umber and ultramarine blue. A 
I'll put in this little dark shape here. I might omit it. I might take it out later. Um, sometimes I tend to edit the way that the the way the glasses tends to leave shadows. Sometimes I alter the way the shadow looks. So I did thin out the paint with this, uh, with just a tiny bit of my odorless mineral spirits. Very tiny. Now let's just move along to the the nose. So it's a little bit of cadmium red medium or flake white in the mid-tone region of the palette. No more complicated than you saw earlier when I was mixing the paint. We're going to put in this little light area. See how transparent the paint is? You can see kind of it's starting to glow because the light value underneath is kind of creating the stained glass like effect. At least I hope it is. A little darker over here. Gotta keep the edges soft. Then of course it gets darker up here. And this is another form overlap. Here's another form overlap. Darker shape here. And then as we angle closer to the light, there's going to be a subtle gradation of value. Very simple. Now moving on down, this area is going to be, it appears to be quite warmer. So I'm pretty much just taking right from the middle tone region of the palette. Just kind of layering the paint on. And of course it's going to get a little darker over here. A little bit darker. And then we're using more of the flake white right onto here. Try to get the warmth of the nose. Try to squint down to see value and open your eyes to see color. So I'm imagining the nasal bone is up there. So there should be a little more light here. A little bit more light and the light slowly trails off down here. I'm going to use a little bit more cadmium red medium flake white directly on the middle tone region of the palette. See how it's starting to look now like they're, the nose is existing in three-dimensional space. A little bit more alizarin permanent in this mixture here. We're going to get even more subtle, very subtle value change towards the side plane of the nose. Darker region of the value scale. Probably too dark, so let's move up on the value scale. This is why I like having the value scale on the palette. I just can very quickly move back and forth 
between my values. Darker region of the value scale. As the nose is turning away from the light, the shape is going to get darker. So we angle towards the light, it's going to get lighter. A little bit more cadmium red and flake white right here. Now we're definitely going to create that stained glass effect, hopefully, over here. See that? See how it's starting to glow? As you can see, traces of the underpainting underneath shining through just like stained glass. Darker region of the palette. And we're going to throw in a little highlight. Just taking directly from my value scale. All right, so moving on down, we're going to start to add some colors onto these shapes. First thing I noticed is that the mouth is placed incorrectly, which again is all right. This is a building process. So I'm just going to relate the corner of the wing of the nose. This is typically how I gauge where the mouth needs to go. I just look at the corner of the wing of the nose being this point right here and uh, just move it over to the side. And then the next thing I notice is that the filter might be too long. So this might actually have to come up just a smidgen like that. Might look kind of goofy right now, but just trying to make the corrections. And all of this, I'm trying to do this linearly before I get into too many values. Now the corner of the edge of the mouth uh, seems about fine, but if I'm moving that over, I guess I should move this over as well. Or just relate it to the wing of the nose. So I relate this point to the corner of the wing of the nose. I think it's fine. Maybe just a little bit. But anyway. We're not trying to copy a photograph, remember, we're trying to interpret visual information. Alright, so I think that's about where I want to put the mouth. I'm just going to kind of cover this shape now. With that. Just re-establish the bottom of the mouth, somewhere over there. And that ought to be just fine. Now switching to a different brush, I'm going to go ahead and look at the structure encompassing the mouth. So that is, I'm going to take a look at the, well, let's start on the corner over here. So starting from the furthest point out, and again, I'm pretty much just taking from the values on my palette. That one might be too hot, so with a little bit of ultramarine blue, let's see if I can tint it. A little bit cooler and that looks about right so remember when I mixed up that palette uh, when I mixed up those value scales I said that the uh, mixtures I would create later are not going to be any more complicated than that and they're not all I'm doing is just tinting the colors just slightly tinting them as I go notice how I tinted that one a little cooler so now, as we move towards this area here, it's going to get a little lighter. Very simple there. And again, we're going to be much more transparent. We're going to paint much more transparent. That means uh, using less paint and a little bit more, I think more of the flake white. Now this area here. Very subtle, very soft edge as well. 
It's also going to get a little darker over here. There's going to be a very definitive form here. So this is a another form overlap. And darker over here. Just as we had it before in the underpainting. Then darker over here. That's going to be a little bit darker here. As we indicated in the underpainting. And it's going to gradually get lighter as we move up. Very simple there. It's going to get a little darker on the side here. So this is another form overlap. And then lighter over here, just as we indicated in the underpainting. Darker again over here. Actually much darker than I had in the underpainting. And again, just painting very transparent. We're building onto the underpainting. Remember, building onto the underpainting, not painting over it. So it's going to get a little lighter here as we start to move up towards the light. It's a little bit darker down here. As we're turning away from the light, let's get even darker down here. It's getting darker here because this form is turning away from the light. This is the bottom of the plane encompassing the mouth. And I paint it really soft. And of course, it's a little bit lighter up here. Very soft edge. And again, darker down here. As we venture down towards the chin. This area is definitely turning away from the light. Darker again over here. Now the relative color is not changing that much. Just taking directly from the palette. And just a tip to you, if you're going to be working in multiple layers, uh, just think about building up the colors. Whereas Ala Prima is more trying to get the color in the first try, which can be a lot of fun, but very stressful at times. This approach, you know, I'm thinking about the value much. I'm putting much more emphasis on the value. Notice how I keep saying it's getting lighter and darker in certain areas. Color can always be changed. Color is a little bit more open to interpretation. Let's get a little bit more pink from the middle tone region of the palette. Right into here, slightly applying the paint. Letting some of the underpainting show. Now I'm gonna get a little more from the darker mid-tone region of the palette. Tint it with a little bit of a lizard and permanent. Now let's go ahead and put in some shapes for the mouth. And make sure the edges are nice and soft. A little bit darker over here. And remember, I'm trying to relate and I'm trying to use a vertical line from the corner of the wing of the nose to this point. Let's 
go ahead and put the corner of the edge of the mouth. This is just burnt umber and ultramarine blue. I think that's about at the right spot. Let's get a little bit lighter now. Not too light. Now, with a different brush, with a little bit of the middle tone region of the palette with the pinkish colors, just go ahead and throw in some warm color for the lower lip. Don't need much. A little bit more of a warm, dark color here. Don't need to spend a lot of time on the mouth. Just putting in enough shapes to get the form to read. What's important is the structure that encompasses the mouth that we spent a little bit of time on. A little light on the lower lip there. There's also going to be a little bit of light on the upper lip. Just on the corner here. Let's add a little bit more warmth to that area. Following the center line. Somewhat about there. See that? Doesn't really take much to get the mouth to look like it's like it reads in space. So let's lightly apply a little more paint. It's a little darker over here. A little bit lighter over here. Nice little flat value over here. This is a little, little plane that connects from this corner, the side of the orbicular saurus, all the way down here. Now there should be a little tiny drop off in value over here as the form starts to wrap around the side. Let's get a clean synthetic brush and just soften the edge. With the same brush, I'm actually going to tint this color. So a little bit of ultramarine blue in the same region of the palette, same region of value on the palette. There we go. Go ahead and darken this shape too. Let's put that dark accent back. Very simple. All right, so now what do you say we give them some eyebrows? So ivory black. Let's use a little bit of alizarin permanent yellow ochre i'm just trying to mix up a kind of uh neutral gray that's not too cold let's use the flake white now maybe a little bit of titanium and that's that's about that's pretty good. So I just want a, a gray that's not too cold. 
Maybe a little bit darker. Right about there. The eyebrow kind of resides a little bit above the glasses, just a little bit. Let's use a little more ivory black. Now we're going to let the brush strokes suggest the, the hair. And over here, same deal. Just with a little light touch, I'm trying to have the edges appear a little bit softer, a little more ivory black. Some alizarin permanent, just to kind of tint the coolness of the ivory black a little bit warmer. Now switching brushes, let's take a little bit of the color from the sclera. Again, again, remember, this is where I mixed up the sclera color. That is the white of the eye. Just a few little spots of light. Don't need much for this. Now we're going to do the same kind of thing with the hair on a little bit of a larger scale. So let's use a bigger brush. Let's just put in the dark first. It's very lightly applying the paint. So I'm letting the underpainting do quite a bit of work for me. Back to the ivory black. It's a little darker over here. Darker over here. And over here. Now switching brushes. Get some of the light here and get some of these little light shapes. Letting some of the individual bristles of the brush mark uh, suggest the hair. Don't want to do too much for that. Very simple little shapes here. And over here, I'm letting the underpainting show to provide some warmth to the colors. I'm letting these edges be rather soft. A little bit lighter over here. Let's see, has to be a little bit darker. Down here. I'm gonna thin out the paint a little bit with some odorless thinner, very little bit. Only takes a little bit to do that. Thin it out too much, so I'm gonna dry it off with the paper towel to the burnt umber. Yellow ochre. Just want to get some of these brush strokes to show. Even some over here. That's why I thinned out the paint a little bit. Just so some of these individual marks could show. 
a little more light over here. Softening the edge in between these shapes. And now I think we're just about ready to fill in the background color. So let's just mix on top of this. A pretty dark value. I'm just going to leave a patch there, sit back, Let's add hmm, a little bit of yellow ochre. So ivory black and yellow ochre, mixing directly onto this area. And I think this value is about right. So I'm going to go ahead and fill in the rest of the background with this color. Now that we have the background covered, the next thing I'm going to do is go ahead and um, mix up a blue, blue jean color for this. So let's go ahead and just kind of test out this blue. A little bit too dark. So let's combine ultramarine blue and ivory black. Let's try it out. Now it's too light. Try it out again. So I think that looks about all right. I think it just needs to be a tiny bit darker. Ultramarine blue, ivory black. Let's put that color over here. Let's just mix all of this together. Let's see. Does that look blue jean enough? Maybe, maybe not. But I think we'll go with this. So let's go ahead and fill this in. Purposefully letting some of these edges uh, go a little bit past, just to try to soften that little edge a little bit. Let's see over here, a little bit of blue. Hmm. Not sure if I'm happy with that blue. Might be too saturated. So let's go go ahead and use the burnt umber. So the burnt umber I like to use the most really these days to desaturate colors, unsaturate them, however you want to say it. That the intensity of that blue is just really starting to get to me. So I'm going to use a little bit of burnt umber into that. I'm going to do something a little risky. So I'm going to take a little bit of my paper towel and just kind of erase or kind of rub into the panel, not pressing down too hard, just to kind of get rid of some of the blue. Now that looks a little better, I think. Let's go ahead and take this, cover the rest of this side course add some burnt umber to it. So of course some of you may know I'm starting to create the vignette. So the vignette is the area in the painting that you leave a little less finished to complement the areas that are more finished. So I'm just going to cover all the way down here and leave some of the underpainting to show through. Let's get a little, little old master with this by letting the underpainting show through at the bottom. Kind of a little old master trick there. Just so folks will know when they see this painting that I used an underpainting. All right. Next thing, next order of business will be to address the area I forgot. So let's, let's mix directly onto the palette. And this value here, just taking from the darker regions of the flesh tone, that whole value needs to get a little darker, a little warmer. And over here, just lightly applying a little bit of paint. 
and that looks about all right. Now I'm just going to combine these two colors here on the palette. A little bit of a lizard and permanent. There we go. Now we have this dark shape. That looks a little better. Now I'm going to combine ivory black and a lizard and permanent. Let's get some of these dark shapes in here for the collar. Simple little dark shape there. And a dark shape here. And over here is a little dark shape here for the collar. As it wraps around over here. And we're going to have a little dark shape over here. Let's mix onto this area here. It's going to be a very dark shape here. It's a little shadow from the collar. Very simple there. We're going to combine these two regions of the palette. Put in a little glimpse of light right here. Just a little touch there. Move higher up on this little value scale. Let's see. Just a few little touches for the collar. few simple little touches. Don't need much. Very simple there. Let's go ahead and get some more of this dark color. Let's use a different brush. Few little touches there. Super simple. And of course, very definitive dark right here. And of course, we're going to be seeing a little bit of light on the collar here. So let's add that light. Just applying the paint very lightly there. Now let's just add a few little highlights for the glasses. So one right about there. Let's see. Let's make it a little bit darker. Some ivory black. A little tiny light over here. You can barely see it. And over here. Little tiny light. Now with a little more titanium white. So just using ivory black and titanium white. Little spot of light there. Go ahead and add a little dash of light over here. Let's use even more titanium white. Just a little touch. Now with a little more Ivory black. It's going to be a tiny little light here. Don't need much. Then the last little spot of light for the glasses that I think I'll put will be right over here. We're just going to take a little bit of burnt umber and yellow ochre and a tiny bit of 
ultramarine blue. And we're going to go and put in the very tiny little final details. These little spots, the little, little freckles. I don't want to put too much of a sharp edge on these shapes. Ideally, I would have wanted to wait for the painting to dry, but I think that I think that will be all right. Just a few little spots. I think that these spots are kind of characteristic to our model. So I think it's a good idea to put them in. Just kind of carefully observing where I want to place them. Just a little spot over here now. And with that, we have the conclusion of this week's portrait painting demonstration. I'd like to thank you all for watching. I really hope that these videos help you out. And of course, I wish you the best in all of your artwork, and I'll see you on the next one.